us and getting to friendship. Together, to friendship. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Continuity, yes. good luck, yes. all those other things. Que aproveche, buen provecho. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> I always have to say that in Spanish. It's like buen appetit, right? Yeah. 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 You can also say in Spanish buen appetito, though, mm. but normally you say buen provecho. What do you guys, what do you say in South Africa before you start a meal? Just say, enjoy your meal. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> what do you say in India? Um, you say, enjoy the meal? Actually, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in Australia, not There's really. It, it, like, you know, if you're religious, you'll say grace before a meal, but otherwise you wait until everyone's in, then, then you're just studying. Get into but in Japan, they say itadakimasu, which, which means, I thought was very good, uh, which means um, enjoy. enjoy the food, thank you for the food, something like this, yeah. I like the idea of saying something, yeah? Yes. In India, nobody has time. They, they're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please don't do other things while you're talking to me? <laughs> yes, because you can tell my train of thought. Yes. Don't type when you're talking to me, Akruti. It's not nice. I'm going to turn off the thing if you talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so how many papers remain? How many papers do you have to write? Four? I have um, one paper for my Chinese art history class. I have one paper for my 18th century. I have my expose for my 18th century, and then I have that paper I need to write for Kathy to bump my B plus up to an A. Cool. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. And uh, LSAT uh, preparation? I told you not to ask about that. Okay. <laughs> I chose to come here because I didn't want to be a typical Indian wife. I needed more freedom. I needed to do what I wanted to do in my life. Um, if I would be living in India, I would be restricted, not restricted by somebody, but that's all the women do, uh, cook, clean, raise their children. And I don't want to do only that. I can do much more than that. I was born in India, a town named Surat. Uh, it, it is part of Gujarat, which is on the, all the way on the left side in India. Uh, Growing up was different from here. When uh, I was growing up, I could go out on the street and play. Over here, my kids couldn't go out and, and play on the street. And the neighbors are, they are more available to you than over here because everybody works over here. So if my mom had to go somewhere and she would tell my, one of the neighbors or my aunt next door to watch us, they would watch us. We were five brothers and sisters, and we shared uh, one room, one bedroom. So uh, we, we had bed at night. Everybody would put the beds, and beds were everywhere. Like, whole floor was covered. So it was fun, you know, um, to share one room, uh, which is lacking in this country. My both children have their own room, so. They do not, they never shared the room. I mean, they did in the beginning, but not anymore. So but we did share until we got married. My husband is my far aunt's brother. And she, they're, they're always looking out for girls who can do all the things. The more the girls can do, the better the girls are, you know, for their brothers or whoever they're looking for. In India, there are jobs assigned. Father looks for the family, the wealth. Uh, if his daughter is going to be happy uh, in that family, if she's going to have enough money. Mother looks uh, at, um, she hears the gossips about the boy. She talks to the ladies about how that boy is, what his character is. If you have older siblings or younger siblings, they would look at that boy before you and come and tell you how he looks, if he, they approve or not. In my case, I was allowed uh, to talk to him, which uh, had just started during my time, because before you weren't even allowed to talk to the boy. You would just have to look at him and say yes or no. And my husband and I talked, and he asked me some questions, and I asked him some questions. And then I couldn't find anything wrong with him, so I said yes. 
since you know, it, 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 it was an arranged marriage, it's not that I knew Yetna very well, but then my sister spoke very highly of her, and um, obviously I would trust my sister. And um, I took her word for it, and I think she was right. Thank you. <laughs> my mom, actually, when I got married, mm. she fainted, mm -hmm. and I couldn't look back. Uh, people over there who were elderly people, don't look back, you can't look back. You know, so it's, I guess, it's Literally a ritual, like, back. you can't look you back, can't yeah. Oh, and she had Yeah, fainted. if you look back, you're gonna come back. Right. I had come out of the house, and I was going down the steps. There are mm. four steps. And then I heard somebody, my cousin, like, oh, she fainted, you know. Mm. And, and then I was turning around, and they did, wouldn't let me. So Aww. that was a sad part, and I yeah. cried all the time when in the car when we were going to my in-laws. My husband was looking at me. He didn't know, poor thing, what to say. So <laughs> so as soon as we reached that, he's like, call your home right now. Call your home. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. You're all ready for math? Yeah, I studied last night. That's good. So did you uh, make a list of the colleges you wanted to see this summer? Uh, yeah, I started Okay, on so it. we have to go over it. Are you going to work this summer? I think I should, yeah, I think I should. No, it's not you should, you feel like working. What do you want to do? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll Then you work. go start applying now. All right. When we came first, uh, after I had my daughter, we used to go to India every other year. We used to give them both cultures. That every time we made a trip, they learned that culture and this culture, but the trips were too expensive. Belonging to two different cultures, it improves my life because I get to see the contrast of two, the two cultures and I get to see what, like, what, what, what's better for me and what I can take from each culture that will help improve who I am. Being in two cultures also has its complications because as, even though like, there are some things I can take to improve my life, there are also things that conflict, like the eating meat. I mean, I haven't eaten meat, but when I was younger, I was tempted. Also kind of worth work ethic because the um, well, for with the Indians, it's a lot stricter, but in American culture, they, they're a little more eased, laid back. So I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle of those two. I can talk to them online, uh, video chat. And so it's like meeting, but it's, it's not almost uh, the same yeah. Yeah. because you miss my I miss my mother's home cooked food and oh those are the things that I miss the most. Yeah. Sometimes I have a laptop so I'll carry my laptop around the house and be like, look at my dog. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. That's what I do. And my, my, my parents wanted to see my son and my son is still sleeping. I go quietly. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's sleeping. At this point I consider myself more American than Indian. One, because I live here, I follow a lot more American customs than Indian customs. And one big thing is that I forgot how to speak my native, uh, the native language of India. And he finally had um, a junior prom. Mm -hmm. And he took one of the girls from this school, okay. uh, Anisha? Anisha, yeah. Anisha Kumar. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you that picture, yeah, it's yeah. cute. But I gave her a camera and he, sh he didn't let her take any pictures over there. <laughs> when I go back to India, it's usually an interval of about five to six years. Last time I went, I was 11 uh, or 12. And when I went there, culturally, I felt a little different. But family-wise, I felt wel welcome because I have a lot of family in India. I remember when my daughter was in a school and she was getting bullied and after 9-11, somebody says like, Arab or something like that. Yeah, Afghan. Afghan. And it was not even called for because we are not Afghan. We are peace living community. If you see Hindu community is a peace living community. And uh, she came and she said, Daddy, this is what is happening. And it was difficult for us to make her understand that this thing goes on. And, uh, you know, you have to try to talk to the person that, you know, you are a different person. You are not the one that that person is thinking who you are. She was only in middle school, and it was hard for me to make her understand. She said, I am American. Why am I called these things? 
So it was hard for me to, uh, to exp how to explain. I, I didn't know how to explain to her exactly. I did my best uh, possibly because I, I just didn't know how to do it. We never confronted this kind of things in India when we were kids. I'm glad here in a sense that I have a good wife, I have a good kids, I have a good life. But then comparatively, if you see it, yes, I would have had probably better life living in India, but I don't regret that. He's the only state for me, and I only decided that for my kids' future. And that's what I, I say. Uh, every time we make some decision, it's based upon we, we put our kids first. And that's how the decisions are made by us. And we never put ourselves first. But sometimes I ask my kids to recognize the sacrifice that mom is making for them or dad is making for them. Just to give you an idea, you know, I wasn't in India when my father passed away. I wasn't in India when my mother passed away. You know, so those two big moments I miss in my life, I wish I were there. The most difficult memory of going home is when, I, when I'm ready to come back here, uh, when I see my father and mother, I think that this might be the last time I'm gonna see them. Yes, so, so you're choosing one A and plus B, right? right. And then you have to find A and B. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, then you uh, rewrite it with A and B on it. Right, yeah. The top. And then you integrate it. Whenever they had difficulty in school, they would come to me. And I was, whenever I was teaching them math, if I use a different word, uh, say from India, and I pronounce a different way because I had a hard accent, Indian accent, uh, they would correct me. So that way I learned how to speak correct English. And I think it has helped me a lot, um, and I improved a lot. I actually basically learned from them. So it was good exchange, math and English. She would help other kids who needed help with the math. She would pull them here, teach them. A guy across from the street, you know, he had a math difficulties, and they all improved their grades. I did win a Golden Apple Award um, because I volunteered for two years, almost two years, uh, in Washington School, elementary school. I helped out a kindergarten teacher every day and whoever needed me, uh, sometimes in pre-K, most of the time in office. Uh, so I was always moving around. Um, and uh, it, during my second year, they, one day, uh, Mr. Karafa came to me and said, you are receiving Golden Apple Award. And I'm like, no, that's for teachers. I'm not a teacher, I'm just helping. He said, no, you deserve it more. Well, if we could clone her, I think that would really be a wonderful thing because her volunteer work, she gave with her heart. By her coming in and supporting us at Washington School, we were able to achieve things that we would not have been able to do. Her go to itiveness her uh, ability to do something and, and help out and be pleasant about it and be on time and be here. So when my son went to middle school, I went there and said, I want to run for president. And they said, incoming parents do not have a chance to run for president. So I asked for the bylaws. And I got a copy of the bylaws uh, from PTA president. And um, uh, I read there, there was nothing in the bylaws that said that six great parents are not allowed to run for the position. So I argued with her. And apparently I found out later that they had a big meeting uh, in the Board of Education with all the principals and they discussed. And they finally decided that, uh, okay, let her run. She's not gonna win. But I had uh, some parents uh, who knew me from Washington School came with me and voted for me because they were also part of a new PTA uh, and they were allowed to vote. So they voted for me and I won. Akruti and Hirsch were wonderful students. And they, they brought up around um, different ideas and, and different problems and different solutions to problems. I remember Akruti writing to the president about women's rights when she was here and getting a response back. And, and it was very interesting because not only did it, it help her on her quest, but it also lit up light bulbs in everybody else's head. 
Yeah, why is that? Why is she questioning that? And why isn't that the way it is? In India, um, women stay home, only husbands work. But there is a discrimination in this society also that I found uh, towards the women, uh, discriminating uh, in um, a pay gap. If you see, uh, there are not many women at the higher positions in government. Uh, I used to work in the bank. Uh, higher administrative uh, jobs were only mostly men. There was probably one to uh, 10 or maybe 15, one to 15 ratio, which is a big gap. And the salary is definitely a gap. And since I've been living here last 20 years, I haven't seen much change. I have become more independent, yes, because uh, I am deciding uh, my own uh, work, what I want to do on my own. It's not decided for me. I started appreciating other humans more. Over there, when I had servants, I probably did not appreciate as much. Uh, but when I came here, I had to do those things on my own. Now I started appreciating other human beings more. And that was the uh, part that was missing in India. When I was getting married, uh, I had to quit my studies mm -hmm. you know, because my sister-in-law's brainwashed me. <laughs> I shouldn't <laughs> say that, but uh, they were like, oh, oh, you're the only one who ha who." can help me, you know, they, she doesn't work good, she doesn't work good. And they were kind of telling me all this. And then my younger sister-in-law came to me one day and she says, um, you know, they were saying that you're going to just go to college every morning and not do anything over here. Mm -hmm. So that made me feel ashamed. Oh. And because I was too much into culture, I was raised in that culture, so mm -hmm. I had to think. And then I quit my study. My my. Um, husband and my father-in-law told me not to do that. They yeah. they begged me not to quit my study, but I did. Wow! Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would have been architect. The pressure, peer pressure. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was in architect architecture. I was doing architecture. Wow! Mm -hmm. But I quit after two years, and then um, I always wanted to finish it. So my kids encouraged me over here, uh, saying, since they were all you know on their own doing their homework and everything, so. Uh, my kids said, Mom, why don't you start uh, the school again? And then I went to SAT classes, and then I took GED classes. So this is the GED certificate. Yeah. I was so happy mm -hmm. because I, I was one of the person who got over 3,000. Wow. We were three people. Wow. So I had very That's high score. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm... You know, always like looking at it. Yes, it says. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that she's going after Yatin is going after her dream. I think that's what's important because she pushed her children, and it's so nice to know that at no matter what age you are, and I'm not saying she's old because I would never do that because learning is an experience until you close your eyes. Uh, I'm very on. Um, very excited that this is happening to her right now because for all the work that she put out at the schools and with her children, she deserves to fulfill what she wants to do in her life. So hats off to Yatna for succeeding and not closing the door on herself because of her, her duties as a parent. One thing I love about Colombia, that there was no resistance uh, from any other students, whether they were young or old. I am probably one of the oldest in uh, those classes. And I'm free to take classes in any colleges. And that's what the things that I love about Colombia. You can sit down with young children, 18 years old, my sons and my daughter's age. And I don't feel, I feel young. It makes me young. I, it makes me forget my age. The fact that my mom goes to school at Columbia, I'm very proud of her for that. There are times I see her, uh, She's, she's really like stressed because she has so much homework and she has to cook. But eventually she c overcomes all that and she come, pulls through. She gets her good grades. My husband and my uh, children are very supportive. They, uh, are on top of uh, managing their own food, sometimes uh, my husband, I hear her, him uh, talking to my son when he plays game, shh, lower the volume because your mother's studying in the other room. So they make sure they don't make a lot of noise because uh, when I'm concentrating on something, uh, when there is too much noise, I cannot concentrate. Uh, 
maybe it's because of my age, but I, they make sure that I have my um, peaceful study time. And um, sometimes when I'm studying late at night, my husband would ask me, do you want anything from Taco Bell or something? <laughs> so, so when he's going like something to munch, or when he's making tea, he would say, do you want a cup of tea also? I'm making tea for myself. So he's like provides me, you know, and that's, that's different. How he has changed from the typical Indian husband to, um, I mean, what he used to be. I used to serve him, now he, start, he serves me. And that's what, you know, that's what's different about coming here, coming to America. Uh, these are the good things that we have adopted, and, and I'm happy. I was sponsored, so that was meant to be an easy process, but there was one hurdle with it. My fingerprints are very faint, mm -hmm. so they wouldn't come through. I got fingerprinted so many times. Kill me? Yeah, they were not acceptable. I mean, <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> so, so I said, what should I do? I cannot new finger. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed because I was talking to somebody and said, ask them if they could do maybe footprints. <laughs> when I went to Japan, as an alien immigrant, mm. you were to be fingerprinted, but no one else gets fingerprinted. Except and Indians. Mm. And, and criminals. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I, to be honest with you, at the age of 21, was so offended that I had to be fingerprinted just because I was not Japanese. I've been fingerprinted here so many times as a teacher because I've taught in Pennsylvania, in New York, in New Jersey, Why do they California. Them? And I'm like, it's all, and, and I say this in Florida, and every time I'm like, I'm really in the system. I'm like, why am I getting fingerprinted again? And it's all through the FBI. So it's mm. not like I'm getting fingerprinted in different localities. I'm going to the FBI to get fingerprinted to be a teacher. Entre dos mundos, Americano and that of Spain. With your blonde hair and your blue eyes, it always seemed easy for you to pass and fly by. Me acuerdo de ti cada vez que sueño. I was born in Ecuador and my mom is Peruvian and my dad is Spanish. And um, it's funny because Peru and Ecuador have like this, you know, rivalry type relationship. But my mom was getting away from things and she went on vacation. And uh, my dad was getting away from his life and he had moved to Ecuador. And he had bought like, um, in Guayaquil, he'd bought like these little chiringuitos by the ocean and uh, made it into like a little resort type, um, hotel type getaway thing. And uh, my mom was staying there and that's how they met. So they had a little love affair, and uh, nine months later, out came me. And, um, but within like <sighs> less than six months of me being born, my dad was like, I gotta move back to Spain to really make a living. You know, I can't really raise a family here. And it was funny because um, then my mom revealed to my dad that she had another son in Peru. And my dad was like, what? <laughs> and so he was like, well, if we're gonna move to Spain, he should come with us. She was probably um, bipolar, and she was also bulimic, and she was an alcoholic. It must have been like five. My dad wasn't around, he was on a business trip, and she got upset at my brother, and uh, decided to start beating him profusely. And this is like one of the earliest memories I have of this. And I looked at it, and I was like, you know, what was going on? And I was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna tell dad. And um, she grabbed an ashtray, just whipped it across the room, and it hit me and knocked me out. And then when I woke up, she was like, if you ever tell him, I'll kill you. She'd play these games that were just horrendous, and you never knew what, what was coming in the bipolar way. So like she would tell you, oh, um, can you please go get my lipstick? It's in my bag. And when my brother and I were living together, he'd always like, I'm gonna get it. And I never understood why he'd go and get it. But when that, once he left, I understood. It was like a code, basically. She'd send you to go get something, and it was never there. And because it wasn't there, she'd tell you how stupid you were, how ignorant you were. Then she would get up and she'd find it, wherever the hell she had put it, whatever it was. And then she'd beat you because you were so stupid. 
I think the most important book in my life um, was this one, Ningún Lugar Está Lejos. Um, in English, it's called There's No Such Place As Far Away. Ray, thank you for inviting me to your birthday party. Your house is thousands of miles away from mine, and I travel only for the best reasons. A, part for, um, a party for Ray is the best, and I'm eager to be with you. And you see the journey that this bird goes through um, to get to her birthday party. And it's the symbolism of knowing that ningún lugar está lejos, like no place is far enough, that my dad wanted to give to me when he left. Like he wanted me to know that no matter how far away he was, that he was always going to be there for me. So maybe when she was 11 or 12, one moment when, when she was very depressed because <laughs> You know, she wasn't, she couldn't understand what was going on. Uh, I'd left home, she, she took it very hard <clears throat> because I've never wanted to include my personal problems uh, with her. In them. And then she was getting depressed and so on. So I took it to the mirror and I said, look at yourself and every morning when you wake up, you can say, I can do it. And she did it. 12, 13, 14, 15, those years were just really bad. Mm. Ended up in the hospital a couple times. My dad tried to take it to court. We failed the first case because she's a great liar. She's like, her? no, she can't, you know, she's fine. You know, like she lies. My daughter lies and she hurts her own self. I've never hurt my daughter. And everyone knew that was happening. They knew it in the school. They knew that she was beating me. They knew it, they just knew, but no one could do anything. Because it's not like it is here in America. And we're talking, God, almost 20 years ago. So, you know, they, people couldn't do anything. My dad really pushed, uh, went to court actually, to get me to go to school. Because I couldn't tell my mom I wanted to go to school in the States. And he had tested me when I was there. And it was obvious I had learning disabilities. And so he knew that that was my way out. He knew that that was what was going to help me get out of my situation. Otherwise, I think I'd be dead. Like, had my dad not pushed for me to leave this country, I think I would have ended up dead. It was really hard because he had to really go to court and fight for me, and my mom wouldn't let me go. And my dad arranged it so that I would meet privately with the judge because he knew that if she was in front, and she was not about to let me. Then she was like, no, I want to be here. And the judge was like, no, I need to meet with her privately. And he came up with a document, very smart man, that looked, uh, that said that because of my learning disabilities, I needed to, and there was no programs in Spain, I needed to go to the States and my grandmother would be taking care of me. It was really interesting to come live with my grandmother who had raised four boys, who nothing knew nothing about women or raising women. She's always worked, well, she's worked with women but never raised a young teenager. And my grandmother is this ultra feminist who refuses to cook because she says the man should be doing the cooking. So she's, that's how she is. She's this an incredible woman who, um, flew planes during World War II and she was a spy and then she worked with civil rights and then she got her master's in social work. And living with her was just incredible because I was able to have a mom, like a real mom. <laughs> we love you and honor you and cherish you. So, so question. Does your dad's cell phone end with 2459? Creo que si. Pops, call me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? So one of the things of coming here to America is that I used to speak with an accent. I used to speak like this a little, not so much, but enough. You know, so it was hard sometimes when I was speaking um, for people to understand me. And I went to international school where you didn't learn English. And so I did learn English. I knew English but I didn't speak it like I speak it now. And I have a very ten pretty strong ear, so I really worked on um, accent reduction and really trying to get rid of it. And I don't necessarily have an accent. I mean, there's certain words that really just come out in my accents, it's very predominant, and I can't help it. <laughs> but um, like anything, like literally, I can't say the L-Y, that's tough words to say like that, it still comes out. I have a couple of glasses of wine, sometimes my accent comes out again. 
And it's a blessing and it's not. It's a blessing because here in America, when you have an accent, either you're eroticized or you're discriminated against. It's one or the other. So as a woman, I know I would be eroticized. My, all my friends are like male friends. Oh, that would be so sexy. Why don't you actually talk with your accent again? Like, Penelope like, Cruz. And I was like, mm, no. The problem is, the blessing in the skies is that people don't realize I'm not from here. So they expect me to understand all these collo colloquialisms and they expect me to understand all these things and culture and all these stuff. And so people will talk, first people will talk about certain cultural things and I'll be like, hey, no clue. <laughs> and, they're like, I, and they're like, how do you not know that? And I was like, I didn't grow up here. You know, there's a lot of issues of race and um, a lot of issues in regards to the way things have been legislated. Um, laws that are in place that sort of target a certain group being a productive member of society and to still be looked upon as if you are, you know, less than, just based on your appearance still. Um, it's something that doesn't sit very well with me. Um, or and, me. And there's, a, yeah, there's still so many barriers, like, I think. I know I get judged because I'm a Latina. And I know really it's just because he's black despite the, what we've achieved in life, you know, despite the education that we have. I get upset because I talk to people and, and people are like, oh, you know, you know, why do immigrants want to come to this country all the time? Why don't they stay in their own country? And I'm like, you have no idea what it's like for people in their own countries. Mm. I'm like, you have no clue what people are going through right. in their own countries. Right. And yeah, my brother's set, he's got a job, his wife has a job, they rent an apartment, but in the Spain, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for example, he she she works as administrative second administrative assistant. He works as a uh, teacher, mm. and together they don't make more than twenty five thousand dollars a year. You kidding me? Yeah, mm. and wow. they they'll never own in Spain. It just will never happen. They'll wow. never own unless they inherit their home from either my father or her parents. Just recently, we've been talking about the Arizona bill, and it's just it it just aggravates me, and it's just it's like really. And then you're looking at different places, like um, here on the East Coast, like, oh, they wouldn't do that. But there's certain counties that are starting to do that. There's copycat legislation that's popping up in yep. Pennsylvania. Yep. And that's, you know, that's right next door. Up in Massachusetts. And, and like, you know, it, it's something that we can't, you know, we can't stand for that because the, the face of illegal immigration, it isn't Polish, it isn't Russian, it's Latino. I teach speech at um, Borough Manhattan Community College. And right after one of my speech classes, I was telling my students that I was going to go protest. And they were like, really? Why are you going to protest? Mind you, all my students at BMCC are predominantly Latino or African-American. Then we started dialoguing about the, the, the bill. And some of them were actually inspired to go and, and come and protest. And I was like, yeah. I used to travel uh, once a year of Thanksgiving to visit her when she was living in Miami. And... Uh, that sort of changed uh, in the past two years because of the economic situation. I've been having personal economic problems and I can't afford to come that often, okay? So every year we'd, we'd meet up and then I'd try to bring her over in the summer to spend about a couple of weeks or with me. And then uh, this year, it's been almost two years since I hadn't, I hadn't seen her. So our physical contacts once a year in theory. I'd like to go back into that if possible. Now the advantage of the crisis is that uh, the airplane rates go down a lot. So flights are cheaper. <laughs> So cute. Where is she? Is she a rescue? Yeah, I got it from North Shore. Yeah. They look from North Shore too. All the North Shore dogs look alike. And there's so many of them. Sure. And they're just, but they're wonderful. <laughs> How old is she? She's two and a half. So. <laughs> What's her name? Nala. This is Layla. Hello, Layla. Hello, Layla. She's got a squirrel. Nest. Squirrel. That's all she wants. Is squirrels. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just like, I just want to get home to my mm -hmm. dog and my mm -hmm. cat. Mm -hmm. that, that's all I want to get home is to both of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And does it cause problems when I date? Yes. Yes. It does. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it happens. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just can't help it. Like at the end of the day, you know, I live my life and I don't have my family here. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all um, they're not here. My grandma lives in LA, but everyone else is in Spain. So I, I, and I don't get to go home very often. Like mm -hmm. last time I was home was 2007. So, and that was now three years. So for me, it's just crucial to be able to have um, 
a family. A family. I do not want to be forgotten. 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 I must have directed over 30 productions with my students. When I was teaching in Miami, a lot of my work centered a lot of social justice. Most of the plays that we did pick also looked at social justice or historical issues. Um, every year in February, we put the predominantly um, a black playwright and a black topic. So one of the things I would do with my students was I would work with them in giving them the historical knowledge first. And a lot of my students didn't know who the Black Panthers were. So everyone from the designers to, because I had my students design, I had my students do costumes, we would spend two weeks historically looking and learning into the civil rights movement. We had no money, no funding, no nothing. And we fundraised and we did our own, we had to create a theater culture in the school. We had to fight uh, sports teams and the privilege that sports teams get. And, we had to get credit, and we did. It took three years, but we started winning awards. I remember our first year, we went to the Florida Theater Conference, and I was sitting next to one of my students, and we're watching these schools in Florida that have amazing theater programs, because theater's huge there. And one of my students turns to me, and he's like, secret, there's no way we're ever gonna win. I mean, there was this one school that in two minutes, 50 kids come in and assemble a house, and I was like, you know what, I was like, it's not always about the glamour and the fuss. They were like, see, Gray, they're gonna win. And then when we won, our set was two crates and ribbons. When I called her, she was teaching in Florida. And when I mentioned who I was, there was this moment where she screamed, because she'd been working on a rehearsal. And so she screams to her kids who were in the room, um, the students at her high school, everyone be quiet, it's NYU! And all of a sudden there was silence <laughs> because for Daphne to come here was as important for the young people she was working with. They were so proud of her and the amount of, you know, the, the congratulatory, um, you know, comments on the, the networking pages and things about them believing in themselves because Daphne believed in herself and saw herself as a PhD candidate. I want to look at the history of Afro-Latino performance. Fantastic. And what's been, you know, produced. So I have this, I have a book that looks at the last, um, well, it looks from like the 1800s to 1940s. Great. And so I'm trying to find a book that fills in from the 40s. You know, but I've been, so I'm working on my dissertation. I had lots of ideas coming here, but I always knew I wanted to look at um, race in, uh, in education of theater and in theater. It's a look at Afro-Latino performance and uh, how it's a representation of what's going on in society today and the relationship between Latinos and Blacks and how the, I believe the Afro-Latino is a link to get Latinos and Blacks to work together towards um, a progress and towards a world with less racism and less discrimination. More and more people of color are coming into higher education, getting master's degrees, PhDs, uh, professional degrees, and it's a reflection of our society. The numbers are reflecting the increasing numbers of people of color in this country, and that's important because it, we can't sit in a place where you know only white people are teaching a diverse population. Getting to know Daphne and the obstacles that she's been faced with um, from early on in life and growing up, and it, it's hard to see many people be able to come through, uh, come through that and, you know, still be confident enough to go after the things that they want. And, you know, she could be a very different person. And a lot of people having gone through the things that she has um, probably would. Um, and it's, you know, it's these things where, you know, people have told her, like, you know, you're not good enough or you're not smart enough and you, or you couldn't possibly do this, that, or the other thing. But, and, and it hurts her, you know? And, um, it's, cry. yeah, and, and she cries and, you know, and she's sad, but she keeps going. I want to get a career. Like, that's why I'm 34 and I'm not married. 
you know, because I want a career. If I was in Spain, I would have been 24 and married with already three kids, probably. You know, most of my friends are in Spain already have two or three, four kids, and that's normal, you know, and, but I, I want a career. I want an education. I want to get this PhD. I really do. I really want that. And I get the question of like, oh, well, Spain, Spain's such a wonderful country. I'm right. like, yes, yeah, Spain's a lovely country. But as a woman, I would not be able to do what I'm doing right now. Wow. Yeah. It's impossible. I would never see the opportunity to become a professor. Really? Mm. Imp- and teach theater? Imp- impossible. It'll ne- never, ever, ever happen. Wow. Mm. Because the academics, the way it's set up, the, the way the country, but as a woman, here in the States, I'm able to get my PhD. I'm able to be a professor. Of course I critique this country. Of course things I want to fix in this country. Um, this country is not perfect. But at the end of the day, as a woman, I can change things here. As a woman, I can educate myself and I can educate other women. I can create opportunities here that hopefully will go back to where I come from and change things. Hopefully I can influence people that will make change elsewhere. I can't do that in Spain. We repent, mm-hmm. so ah. I, I learned to eat uh, with this, like, maybe I was 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Because we don't use, nowadays they do. Mm-hmm. But before we didn't, so. Mm-hmm. But what about the British influence? In That's India, why I and, ha- and hence, mm-hmm. you know, about but using the, the knife. Yes. But yeah. Indian food is in such a way, mm-hmm. you just cannot eat with it before. Yes. It's, it's a flat bread yeah. which you need to break it with your hand mm-hmm. just, oh. Oh. and dip it in the curry. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so funny, hey, because as, you, as you're speaking, one of my earlier memories about using cutlery, mm-hmm. um, because it's quite ridiculous, like look at this. You're supposed to put the corn on the back of the fork. Yeah. Now, the... when those are peas, guess what? Oh. Peas are round oh, no. and they roll off. <laughs> and as a kid, you're like, I've got one, I've got one, you know. And I remember going to my friend's house and I must have been maybe eight. Mm -hmm. And her parents were very particular that you had to put the peas in and you couldn't cheat. Cheating was when you got the mashed potato (laughs) and then you got the peas because they they didn't eat it. (laughs) Right, and you couldn't do that, but I was doing that. And so I was very successfully eating my peas and and my friend was was (laughs) trying to eat her peas. And she finally said to her mum, can I do what Melanie's doing? And her mother said, no. And I said, what am I doing? She said, you're cheating, you're using the mashed potatoes, you're not supposed to do that. And I was turned bright red. You know, because I was like, I didn't know I wasn't using the correct <laughs> indicator. You know? Ancestors were sent to Australia as convicts. My, uh, actually, on my mother's side, um, my great 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 grandfather, or there might be a few more greats in there, and uh, he was sent over to Australia from England for the term of his natural life for drunk and disorderly, seven charges of drunk and disorderly. So there were no rapists or murderers in the family. Um, and to be honest with you, the family thinks it's hilarious. You know, we're, we're quite proud of our ancestor. Um, my parents did a really good, of, good job of raising us with the idea that things always had to be fair. So I was raised with this sense that everything needed to be equal. And then when I started to observe the world around me, I realised actually that wasn't the way things were. And particularly I saw women kind of getting the the raw end of the deal. So as a kid, of course, you start speaking out about that. And my God, did it cause trouble. You know, even like, for example, I remember very distinctly with my grandparents, um, my grandfather would sit at the table, the pantry was right here. And he would say to my grandmother, who was at the other end of the table, I need the salt. The salt was right here. She would get up and go and get the salt for him. And I remember as a kid, you know, realising what was going on, and I said to him on this one day, I said, Pop, the salt's right there, get it yourself. And the family all went, because my grandfather was quite a, you know, a strong man. Um, To his credit, he laughed, and my grandmother thought it was fantastic. Um, And he did, he got the salt on his own. Education to me represented my ticket out of 
um, not only my hometown but also to a different life than what my parents had. You know, again, it's small town and they're working class people and they work their butts off. But it was tough. It was really tough economically. And I think from a very early age I equated um, having a little bit more money with uh, life being a little bit easier and certainly having more choices. So academia was my way out of there and I had it in my mind that if I did well in school and got on to go to college, that I could not only leave back a smash, which wasn't really my, my place, um, and it also would put me on a, a trajectory with a career that would uh, enable me to have a very different life. I think in my family initially, uh, for sure, there's, there was a feeling of being a little bit intimidated about the fact that I was um, getting an education. I mean, when you're the one getting the education, it's like, big deal, you know? I mean, you, you're just at school and you're learning a lot of stuff. But I realise when I think about where they came from, you know, my mum finished school at 15 and my dad barely <laughs> finished school and certainly was not very um, academic from his, uh, the way he, he talks about his academic career. Um, and uh, I learned very early on, you know, that I needed to make sure I kind of didn't get a big head. So I've always been pretty reserved with what I talk about with the family, and I think that's filtered through. I mean, since I did my undergrad and even did, since I did my master's degree, like, we just don't talk about it. Did we tell you the news? No. We got accepted. No! <laughs> Yes. Oh my God, yes. when did you find out? Uh, about four days ago. What? Yes. So you find out you got a green card, you find out you're pregnant yeah. in the last yeah. four days? I don't know, I knew I was pregnant about yeah. <laughs> two, two and a half months ago. You just found out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is fantastic. Yeah, so we went to see our lawyer today and, um, yeah, but no, oh gosh, we've got a list this long of all the documentation we have to get. But, um, yes, yeah, so now officially, um, um, on official US stamp, Kingsley is an alien of extraordinary ability. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well done, babe. That's yeah. fantastic. How does that feel? Oh, it's great. It's great. Because he can't work as a doctor, um, right. as an attending, unless he's a, a green card. Exactly. So it's not just staying here. It's the ability of, you know, working here. Yeah. 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 Oh, so, that's so yeah, fantastic. It's so what does that do to your status then? Um, so I'm just the wife of an extraordinary alien. <laughs> When I graduated from college, uh, Melbourne Uni in Australia, uh, the Australia was going through a massive recession. So the unemployment rate at that time was like 13, 13.5%. So I just graduated with a biochemistry degree. So the likelihood of getting a job in that economy was just crazy, it was so tough. At that time, I went out and I applied for, you know, I can't remember how many jobs, just, you know, waitressing, bartending, and uh, it was crazy. I was just getting turned down left, right and centre. So a friend of mine who was studying Japanese at Melbourne Uni um, told me that they were interviewing students, really, who were studying the language Japanese to come out to Japan to be golf caddies. So I went and had this interview and kind of made out that I knew a lot more about golf than I actually did and um, was accepted, got the position and flew out within about six weeks of getting the job. When I arrived in Japan, I had had six weeks of language studies and I was so overwhelmed, quite frankly, that I couldn't remember the difference between hello and thank you. Those words are quite similar, dormo and dozo. So I remember thinking, oh my God, I don't know how this is gonna go. What was really humbling, and to be honest with you, really stressful, is that I was illiterate in Japan. You can't read any of the signs, you can't understand anyone unless you speak the language. Going to even the ATM cash machine, everything is in Chinese characters. So everything that I wanted to do as an independent adult I needed help with. I would copy down the characters, you know, on the cash machine because that was pretty important to know how to get cash out of the out of your cash machine, and uh, I would match the characters. Growing up in Australia, I would often hear people complain about our immigrants that they didn't speak English and they shouldn't be here if they can't speak the native language, etc. So it really helped me to empathise a great deal with just how difficult it is 
A, being in a country when you don't speak the language and how isolating that can be, and B, how difficult it is to learn a second language. There were a lot of work opportunities in, um, in Japan and one of those was teaching English. And you could make a crazy amount of money as a new college grad. Um, and uh, so that's what I did. So I finished up um, with the golf caddy business up in the country and went down to the city and got a job there as an English language teacher. Yeah, Guys, I want to share something with you. Okay, I'm a little bit nervous actually. I've I'm actually shaking. Um, this is something that is connected to my life in Australia. So mm -hmm. I left Australia when I was 21. I'm now almost 41, so I've lived overseas for 20 years, half my life. My grandmother gave me this um, when I was 21 and jumping on my plane to fly to Japan where I would live for eight years. And so what she, uh, I had a very, sp I have had a very special connection with my grandmother. She was probably my rock mm. in my life as a as a young girl growing up, when my parents were kind of doing their thing and being a bit crazy. She was the one I would go to. Um, so she is, um, she's very very special to me. So when I left um, to go to Japan, I'm not religious at all, but my grandmother, you know, she goes she goes to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So she gave me, which I think was incredibly special, her own oh, rosary yeah. beads. Yeah. It's amazing actually holding that, these. Yeah, that, you, I you can feel, feel that uh, yeah, you the connection. have a piece of that's right, that's you. right. And, you know, I didn't know it at the time because when she gave them to me, I was like, Okay, rosary beads. What, what, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> I'm not going to be praying over there, Dad, you know. Um, but it's it's something that she cherished. Yeah. And what I didn't know at the time is that when she gave them to me, uh, when I opened it up once I arrived in Japan, she had put a letter in there. Oh, no, wow. I haven't read this letter for maybe 10 years. So um, I was going to read it this morning yeah. and then I thought I'd like to just wait until I got here and read it with you guys if okay. that's okay. So yes. it's, I'm shaking because my grandmother passed away um, a few years ago so it's kind of like hearing her words, mm -hmm. you know. Is it okay if I share it with you? Yes. Oh, my God. Okay, so here we go. <sighs> okay. My dear, Mal my dear Mulaney, just a small gift to help you on your way. Thank you for the beautifully worded card, which I appreciated. Have a great time, and I'll be thinking of you every day until you come back. All our love, Nana and Pop. Obviously, my grandfather was still alive then. Love you lots. Um, wow, just seeing her writing. And you know what? She wrote me a letter every single week when I was in Japan. Wow. Yeah, for eight years. Yeah, so I have this stack of all of, of her letters. letters. Yeah. And then... Um, just before she passed away, she wrote me a letter and uh, then I found out that she had passed away and I flew home for her funeral. And um, after the funeral, I went back to Japan and her letter was there waiting yeah. and I couldn't open it. And mm. I didn't open it for about six months. I just left it on the table because I knew when I opened it and I read it, that was it, that was the last letter. I got my degree in clinical nutrition when I first came to the States. That was the main reason actually for me to come over is to study here at NYU. Um, at the time before I came out, I was still living in Japan. So I wanted to continue on with my studies in clinical nutrition. And the decision was, do I go to London or do I go back home to Australia? And at that time, I decided to come out here to New York and check it out. And I love the campus. I love the people there. And I just thought, this is it. This is where I want to go and do my master's. After living in New York and experiencing life here, I really don't feel that Australia is the right fit for me. When I go back to Melbourne, I love it, but I also, I know it, it's so familiar. And I feel that what really inspires me or what I really love about life is being someplace where I can make a living, I can, you know, have a great life, but it's also a bit challenging because it's not, it's not my comfort zone. It's something that's slightly different or actually in the case of Japan, very, very different. And so therefore I'm constantly learning new things. That's the kind of environment that I love. Even though we speak English, uh, the Australian accent is uh, a little bit tricky here in the States. And I have to say the first year or so I was kind of mocked at times where people would be like, what? 
Um, so you learn very quickly though, don't you? So you learn how to modify some of the syllables and, you know, pronounce something with a little bit more of a whatever edge that you need to. So the irony of that is that even though I feel now I'm probably better understood, um, people still think that I have a very strong Australian accent and then my family think that I've got an American accent. So it's kind of like whatever. My migration's been tough on my family in general, I think, um, mostly on my mum. My dad has actually embraced it in many ways and he said to me, you know, just keep going, just keep going, stay as long as you can overseas. I know on the other hand, though, he is at a time in his life where he would also like his kids to be closer, so I think there's that duality to it for him. My mum has said to me that she thinks I don't have an identity because I, you know, lived in Japan for eight years, I was born in Australia, I've lived here for ten years. So her question is really, who am I? Which, to be honest with you, was very hurtful because I embrace the fact that I'm Australian. Like, I know I'm Australian. I love that about, about my existence. Um, but. For me, it's not mutually exclusive that if just because you live somewhere else, that therefore you lose your identity of where you came from. After I graduated here at NYU, I worked for a couple of different um, places initially. I had like three part-time jobs as I was gaining more clinical experience. And then I went out on my own to start my own private practice. And I have to tell you, fear is a great motivator because I went from, you know, having a reasonable amount of income coming in to quitting all my jobs and going basically cold turkey. So no income whatsoever and I just had to build my practice. In the first six months, I reached out to about 100 professionals and about 75 of those people called me back and eventually with playing phone tag and whatever, about 50 I was able to meet with face to face. Then within 12 months of that, I needed to hire someone else to come into my private practice. It was that crazy. I wanted to talk to you about a project for the summer. Jen, I just sent you an email. Do you mind pulling that up? Mm -hmm. It's about, um, you know how we're thinking of getting an IDAP chapter started here in New York City? Mm -hmm. So what we're wanting to do is um, get together with IBITS and um, pull a whole heap of um, our referral people together, you know, some of the clinicians here in the city to kind of just have a kickoff gathering. Here at Melania Rogers Nutrition, all of the staff are female. And personally, something that I've wanted to do in my professional life is to create an environment, a work environment and a work culture that is really supportive of women. I've worked in other industries before and, you know, there's the glass, the glass ceiling and there's a lot of different barriers to women um, being able to pursue their careers and earn the kind of money that they're entitled to. So one of my objectives here uh, within my business is to really create an environment that is very supportive, uh, very empowering, um, where we, you know, we reimburse women at the rate that they should be reimbursed. I worked, started working with Melinda Rogers Nutrition because I really enjoyed the way that she treated her clients. Um, she had such an open heart towards them. She didn't just see them as somebody who walked in the door and she was looking to get a paycheck from them and push them on. She really cared and had deep levels with them. Um, I call it, for lack of better words, food therapy because you're not just going ahead and giving somebody a diet. She knows very deeply all the things that have, um, are going on with them. Um, just by the way that they walk in the door, the way that their body language is. When I was in my 20s, actually, I myself suffered with anorexia for about five, six years. And um, at that time, it's funny, you know, because that it never occurred to me at that time or after I recovered that I would go on and work with eating disorders. Uh, and it wasn't until I got here, I was working with um, people who had binge eating disorder and compulsive overeating, and it was at that point where I realised my own experience of having suffered with an eating disorder was really valuable in my understanding what they were going through because that's a big factor with our eating disorder clients is that they feel so isolated that no one else can possibly get it because, you know, it's, it's a pretty torturous existence. And without them actually knowing that I have had an eating disorder, I, I, I understood where they are at so I could really help with you know, challenging those beliefs um, and helping them through their recovery process. I 
am thrilled to say that I've made a huge decision, probably one of the biggest decisions in my life to, to become a single mum. And this has taken me years of consideration to get to this point. So my decision to become a single mother really came from the fact of, um, I hate to say it, but there's a biological clock. Um, I was also previously in a relationship, in a marriage, and we were planning a family at that time. And when the marriage fell apart, um, I felt that my chances of being a mum also disappeared at the same time. And then it took me a year or two to realise that I actually could do this on my own. And then you and I were talking about we're going to be pushing our carriages together. Yeah, Jill and I, well, actually, Kingsley will have to include Desi on this. Um, yes, Jill, and, Jill and I are hoping that we'll be new mothers Moving about the along, same yeah. time. And same with Desi. Yeah. And you too, Sharon. You'll be a little bit That's right. ahead of us. <laughs> you'll be I can a little give, bit you give my stuff to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so we can have mum and bub's groups here. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'll just provide the wine. <laughs> it's an essential piece, isn't it? it That's what so. my sister says in Australia they do. They sit around so they can have glass of wine and <laughs> kids are... <laughs> I'm the only member of my family here in the States, so my kids won't have even the access to their aunts and uncles that I did. But, you know, I thought a lot about it and I do believe in a chosen family, like kind of you can create your own family and living abroad you have to, you know, like when you don't have your family around, your friends take on um, a heightened role. Your friendships really do because your friends actually end up doing a lot of things for you that family members would normally do. Like when you need to move apartments, it's your friends who are there rather than your dad with your pickup truck or whatever. Um, and as I contemplate becoming a mother myself, I'm acutely aware that I want my, my child to have a sense of community and that I'm going to need to create that. I wonder what it's going to be like. I even think about identity. I have an Australian accent of sorts and I'm Australian. And if my child has an American accent, which surely they will, um, does that mean that their identity is American? Or if I teach them to speak with an Australian accent, does that mean that they're more Australian? You know what I mean? Like philosophically, they're kind of interesting questions to ask. Um, but um, my, the end, at the end of the day, my goal is for my child to be happy no matter where we're living and um, that I will embrace every aspect of the cultural norms here that raising a child entails. My husband was here first mm -hmm. and he was an uh, immigrant too. He, he wasn't citizen yet. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at, during the time we got married, they had a not very good relationship with India, probably. Uh -huh. So they weren't allowing that many Indians at the time. So the process was very long. I mean, after I got married, my husband came back because he had work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had to wait 11 months before wow. even I got my visa call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My brother, he eventually got citizenship and he's immediately, he immediately gave his citizenship to um, his daughter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that she has it because he knows he wants to move here. Mm -hmm. And but he cannot file for his wife until he's here because he's already gone to the embassy mm -hmm. and been like, we've been married for three years. And they're like, oh, you can't file unless you're in the United States. The part of you as a country, the harder it is to move to other mm -hmm. places, even if it's temporary. I look at my own country as an example with mm -hmm. South Africa. Americans can go there, they don't need visas. Mm -hmm. But for a South African, which are not many oh. that want to come to the US, the visa process, I mean, it's an understatement to say it's humbling. My mother comes to visit me once a year too. And for her, applying for a visa, it's like one of those threatening experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, she wouldn't even sleep well the night before she's going to the consulate to go really submit. Because it's that is stressful. It's, it's stressful and it's intimidating. to see if you still know the song. Yeah. 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 the song. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Show, 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 loza, show, show, loza. Uye zindaba, stimela, spuma, South Africa. 
Wenu ya baleka, wenu ya baleka, uye zindaba simelas kuma South Africa. I was born by parents who belong to two different ethnic groups. And in South Africa, under apartheid, the system tried emphasizing ethnicity. I never saw myself as um, non-South African, but obviously the government saw me as a non-South African because they had a system, the a Bantu stand system or homeland system that they created based on ethnicity and artificially created, moved people through forced removals to take them to go live in those places. My father had a business and uh, the only place he could get his license and continue to practice was in a homeland. My father was working when he started running the business. He wasn't home all the time. He was at his business, which was lots of um, miles away. So he wasn't coming home every day. The person who was a constant figure, even waking, was my mother. She would wake us up in the morning because we're girls. Girls cannot sleep late. And it was worse on the day that my father is there, like, wake up, your father is here. I think my mother lived for her children. Teenage years, it was like, I don't think she's my mother. She must have adopted me. And as I got older, I sort of get closer. So became my confidant, uh, my friend, and uh, that just shaped the kind of mother I wanted to be to my children. That's my mother. And these are my two cousins, my two sisters, my uh, daughter-in-law. Oh. New Year's <laughs> Eve party was just the women of the family. Oh, I wow. come from a very <laughs> matriarchal family and we decided it was going to be a women's party. One of my favorite moments that I remember was my two sisters and I going to the shops and uh, everybody knows you. So the owner starts talking to us like, oh, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I answer first, I say, I want to be a nurse. And my two sisters burst out laughing and I looked at them like, why are you laughing? They said, have you seen such a dark skinned nurse? Like. You can't qualify that both of them are slightly lighter than me, but it was like, I couldn't even be a nurse. I'm too dark to be a nurse. <laughs> Education in South Africa was not free for blacks. It was free for whites. It was free for Indian. And it was free for the so-called colored people. For the Africans, we had to pay. We had the teachers that were employed by government to work there and um, they were whites, except those who were teaching mother tongue, and uh, they were very, very cruel. I mean, I've never seen educators so cruel. You could see the pleasure in their faces when they were beating us up, and they were paid extra salary compared with our colleagues teaching in the white schools. It was called tolerance fee because they're tolerating teaching black kids. I learned to eat a meal that had a worm in it and just put it on the side because there's no other meal. The conditions were so harsh that it made you question, why did I end up here? Why, what am I doing here? And why are other people not here? My university was one of those highly, highly politicized universities. All that we did for entertainment was talking politics and uh, learning more. And I would be amazed at how much people knew because it was at the time that there was so much censorship in South Africa that uh, you read certain books almost with the light off and a flashlight under the bed. Didn't want your roommate to know you are even reading a certain book because then in no time you get uh, really arrested or followed or targeted. They would release a dog inside um, the hall, and I'm really terrified of dogs even today. And part of it goes back to that period. So I never got arrested. And I think part of it was as soon as I had the police were around and the dogs were barking, I would be out through the other door. Ultimately, I had to escape because I was getting death threats. And on one of the days, came home there were people there from the conservative ultra-wing, right-wing, by my gate, 
all armed in guns, dressed in the khakis and swastikas on their arms and all. And uh, when I came, I said, communist, and all that, and shouting. And I said, are you the ones who are sending death threats coming to kill me? And they sort of waved. But I was sitting there waiting for this gun to go off. I escaped with one of the student leaders on one cold winter morning. At that time, I had a passport from the homeland, which I took under my marriage name. And it, for me, it was a way of playing the politics to see if my name is targeted and they wouldn't give me one. So they gave me, and it wasn't in my last name, it was in the marriage name that I, I had never changed to, so I wasn't using it. So we come out at 4 a.m., I've bundled the kids, they're sleeping on the back seat, I'm sitting with this guy, and we're driving and we come to a roadblock. As we approach the roadblock, we look at each other, say, it was nice knowing you because we knew that I'm sure it's the end. As it's typical, 4 a.m., they send the most junior staff member who comes out there, ask for my driver's license, I pull out that one with the ID that has a different name and looks at us, we're just a family, and let us go. Do you I remember mean, that party when you uh, really threw a party that ended up in the morning and I had to go straight to the airport from here? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That was your going uh, away party. It was my going away party. It was when yeah. you were going to go on sabbatical. What do we have? We have tapas that night? Tapas, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah we did. Yeah. It was great. Wow. And dancing. Dancing, a lot of dancing, music, and all. And I just remember getting onto that plane, like, am I really going today? Should I go? Shouldn't I go? Dancing. And you're the one encouraging me not to go forever because I wanted to go for good. Yeah, you were thinking about going back mm -hmm. to South Africa, but mm -hmm. I would not let you do that. You know what the good part was? Wow. I got lots of gifts, send off gifts, and yeah. I came back. <laughs> I think I missed that party, unfortunately. I came to the States in 85, I was 82. I was curious about uh, the U.S. And uh, I wanted to come and study here as a way of just getting to know the U.S. This scholarship was from the U.S. It was a Fulbright scholarship, it was from, the, from America. For me, America stretches from the bottom all the way up, so I didn't have much information, and I applied, I got interviewed, I was asked where I wanted to study, I said, in the north, meaning North America. So they placed me in the north of the state, <laughs> so I ended up in uh, Wisconsin. That's where some of my sort of political values and beliefs slightly changed. I mean, I started appreciating the other diversity because people that I was interacting with, fellow students and all, I was the only black in class and they were warm and embracing and talking to me. And I think that for the first time, it made me realize that I'm isolating myself within the black consciousness movement, but I needed that as a way of getting to know myself first. South Africa has got excellent policies on paper. Right. They're all there, we've seen, we've heard how politicians, scholars, everybody talks about these excellent uh, policies. And uh, at the same time, 15 years later, looking into the country, did we see them being implemented? One of the most prominent things I think about when they were talking about integration of schools and bringing about, you know, all classes, um, together, all races together, is the uh, elementary and middle school we went to where it was predominantly white uh, during apartheid, but as soon as they opened up for integration and blacks started coming into the school, there was um, an exodus of white students. I think there was, what, one white student there while we were there. <laughs> I'm a professor at NYU, and uh, I teach uh, courses that have got an international dimension in them. And... Uh, one of the courses is uh, International Perspectives on Education. And that was the first course I designed when I got to NYU because uh, when I arrived, 
I first did a little project of looking at all the courses to see how much international material was in the courses, and none of them had an international dimension. Each time a group comes back, they would talk about how the courses transformed them, and that pushed me one year, myself and Colleen, my friend and colleague, that uh, we should really try to unpack the concept, what do they mean by being transformed? And we did a little study, and uh, what we realized is that that's the introduction to making them global citizens, because after that, they talk about how they want to do things for other people even outside the U.S. in ways that they had never thought about. We walk into this place, very conservative in the rural part of South Africa. And uh, it's Colleen and I and Marcela, not another student. One of our students. We're going to the bar, restaurant bar. At the counter, Colleen orders a wine, comes to the table. Nice big glass. I think it was bigger Just than like this. That. Just no, like that. no, it was bigger oh, than yeah, this. It, grows, it was like it this. It grows in <laughs> your imagination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's what it felt. That's what it felt like. Yeah. Marcelo okay. goes there, comes back with this big glass of wine. I go there, and I come with a mini glass of wine for the same price. She did. <laughs> she came back with this little <laughs> glass of wine, and, and she I, sits down next to me. And, and Marcel and both of them being white, like drinking out of big glasses, and I'm drinking out of a small. And I said, how come you guys got big glasses? How much did okay, you pay? you forgot something. Well, okay, that's why I told okay. you to tell the story. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was in so much pain, I couldn't remember most of the things. Okay, yeah. so no, you, I went and got a glass of wine, I got this big glass of wine. You came back with this little tiny, tiny glass, glass of, of wine. wine. Oh, and you said, you see this, this is a problem. I knew I knew immediately what was going on. You did. You knew immediately. And I said, no. No, that's not true. I said, no. Maybe they ran out of glasses, right? Yeah. You know, I'm always, you know. And so then our student, Marcella, came over. And we said, OK, let's experiment. Let's do our own little research yeah. here. You yeah. know, let's send her up to get a glass of wine and see what happens. That, and she's to see if they run out of glasses, student. yeah. So yeah. she so she goes her. there, she comes back with a big glass. Big glass of wine. And you go there, you come back with another big glass. I said, let's go see. And I go there. We went and, together. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're standing together we at the together. counter. Yeah. And you order your wine, you get it. I order my wine. The woman, big, white, African woman, bends down, opens the fridge, takes out an already poured glass and puts it there. <laughs> And I said, why do you give me that glass of wine that's ready? And she says, oh, they're the same. I said, no, they're not the same. Can you pour me a fresh glass of wine? So she goes around the corner. I suspect she just took another glass and dumped it and brought it. And I just took it out of desperation. Now we're out in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And uh, we go sit down and I said, I don't want to drink that wine. I suspect it's all the leftovers from the table that she's putting into one glass waiting for a black client. <laughs> I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen where, where it. Where were you, in Pretoria? Or no, Chipisa, in, uh, on the border of yeah. Zimbabwe. Oh. Yeah. I realized at one point that um, my six-year-old had lived in seven places by the time he turned six. And one day he said to me, Mom, where's home? So we bought a place in Pretoria and we agreed that it will never be sold. So when we left that home, came to New York, we agreed that we're all going to come here for three years. It worked well for the kids, the school, they're going to be able to continue when they get back to South Africa. Everybody was going to be able to catch up. But my ex-husband was uh, studying at that time, didn't want to go back, so we stayed a little bit longer. And my youngest son was very adamant that uh, we had said we're coming to live in the U.S. for three years. He has lived in the U.S. for three years. He has enjoyed it. He had put his life on hold for three years. He wants to go back home. And I was torn between my ex-husband and my son. 
And uh, after considering for some time, we realized that, well, we could let him go ahead for two years, and by the third year, we'll go. I maintained two homes on, the, on both sides of the Atlantic, and it came to a point where now my daughter was graduating from high school. That was another point in which to decide where to go live. And uh, at that stage, I had decided that it was now time for me to go and be with my younger son and uh, live back in South Africa. And at that stage, my daughter too was willing to go back to South Africa, but the kind of program she wanted wasn't being offered in South Africa. So I felt, okay, for her, she can go to college and I'll go back to South Africa. So I did that and I went back and lived in South Africa. And it was very hard for me because I realized that um, for my young son, the whole family is there and um, he spends weekends with them. He's in boarding school during the week and my daughter is out here and I'm not there. And uh, at that stage, I decided I better pack my bags once more and go live where she is so that I can be with her. The one trip that I took going back home that was the most challenging trip was when I was taking my daughter back now as a corpse on the same plane in the cargo. It was a very difficult trip for me, the whole trip. And because of the publicity that had gone with it, everybody on the crew knew who we were and knew. So you felt eyes were on you all the time and everything. And um, at the same time, just the pain of just sitting in that plane for 17 hours with her in the cargo. Mm. Mm. It's, it's nice. Mm. Oh, look. You pulled I out that green it. one I too. <laughs> Last one strawberry there. I've known uh, Tobaho since uh, we met in February of um, 01. And uh, we met on a flight from Johannesburg to New York. He was meant to be sitting next to a couple that was squabbling and they were not sitting together. So I offered that I could switch with one of them. I still can't believe to this day that actually happened because I think a lot of us that travel a lot, the last thing that we really want to do is engage in a conversation with a perfect stranger. And it turned out that we hit it off so well that we, uh, the flight was 16 hours. I think we probably talked for 12 of them. He had some fruits and all that, all wilted, of course, because he had been driving all day in the sun and he offered me and I'm polite, so I wasn't going to say no. I think it was about two months after that, I was in New York for business and I, uh, I went down to the apartment in, uh, in the village and met, met her husband then and, the, and uh, Tumi and uh, Lebo, her kids. We got to know each other, send each other cards once a year, just over Christmas. And then in 04, her Christmas card was only signed to Boho and Kids, and I thought, something happened. <laughs> and uh, so we've been together pretty much since then. Steve is great with uh, my kids and uh, my family in general. Her boys are such good, good kids, and it's always, uh, always look forward to seeing them. It's a big family. I, I only had one, one brother, and we're very close, but it's different um, with all of her siblings and nieces and nephews. Just becoming a, a grandmother now, it's, uh, it's like I have my first grandson. One of my favorite quotes is by Thomas Paine, and he says <laughs> that, um, my country is the world, and my religion is to do good. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought about that with you, you mm -hmm. know, that 
you come here and you fit in so well. Mm-hmm. You go there, you fit in so well. I think one of the things about Toboho uh, is that the people that meet her are their lives are so enriched just from that. Uh, and, and if you think about it, if it weren't for us having um, such open borders, really, uh, you know, for her to be, even be here is, uh, is all of the, the whole country benefits from people like her uh, being here. And uh, I know I can't imagine my life without her, and uh, I think that's probably the way everybody that knows her feels. I feel really lucky that uh, my life is duplicated in two countries. I have a community of friends, some so close that they're like family to me. And in South Africa, I have my friends that whenever I come back, it's like I've never left and I have my family. So I feel at home in both and it feels strange when I travel like now having gone to New and to Norway. When I came back, it's like, wow, it's so nice to be back home. And that's the same when I land in South Africa. So I feel like I belong in more than one place and I just love it. This area is more, uh, it's like a melting pot. Then I went to college in Colombia. I realized all these students from different all backgrounds. All over the world, huh? Yes, all over the world. Right. And I, I get exposed, I got exposed to different languages, mm-hmm. different food, different mm-hmm. cultures. There's the pe- personal benefit, there's the financial gain, mm-hmm. sure, but I think there's a broader gain too, which is cultural understanding. Oh, yes. Because letting people move and learn about each other, yes. because I think influenced by apartheid that kept people separate, right. because the less you know about the other person, the more you see them as an as enemy, a, as a yes. right. threat, and all that's that. Right. But just softening those boundaries and letting people immigrate, live amongst others, and yes. so on. Yes. If it's not immigration or migration, just mm. travel does that, you know, to uh, on a much True. smaller scale. But travel enables that kind of kind of understanding, right? Mm-hmm. And mixing of people between different places. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of ignorance in this country, but at times it's funny. Like for me, I, I because I live here now, I see oh, I want to change this, I want to change this, I want to change this. That I find that's like socially unjust. And my brother's like, it's just, but it's so much better than Spain, Daphne, and I'm like. It is, but we can make it better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's true, it's, it's, it is better than where I grew up, but I still want to make it even better. Mm-hmm.